So before I begin, um, I'd like to just have a, a bit of a shout out to my table 50 all the way at the back. Uh, <laughs> What we, uh, what we don't have in terms of uh, view of the front stage, we make up for with friendship. So, more to the point, uh, it's true that Mr. John Stackhouse is kind of an idol of mine. Um, he worked his way up from being a development issues correspondent based out of New Delhi to become the editor-in-chief of the Globe and Mail. Mr. Stackhouse's ascent is one of legend. Under his tenure, the paper has seen a prominent redesign and a renewed focus on content and variety. Mr. Stackhouse himself has an impressive array of personal accolades that include five national newspaper awards, a national magazine award, and an Amnesty International Human Rights Reporting Award. What struck me most when reading about Mr. Stackhouse was his commitment to journalism. Having spent a full week on the streets of Toronto, learning firsthand the difficulty faced by Canada's homeless, he showed an investment in reporting unlike any seen before. The article he wrote as a result electrified the world of journalism. In our increasingly digitized world, it is clear to me at least that print will need more and more articles like those in order to survive. Mr. Stackhouse is at the helm of a new era in journalism, one that is likely to shape the future of the medium itself. So now, without further ado, let us all uh, join in a round of applause for this year's Founders Dinner speaker, Mr. John Stackhouse. Thank you so much, Colleen. That was, uh, that was very kind of you. And I was thinking as you were speaking, I'm so glad I was born when I was, because uh, I sure wouldn't uh, have made it into UCC yet, gotten through here, I suspect, I suspect today. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, be invited to, to give the Founders uh, Dinner address. This is really a bridge between the college's uh, extraordinary past and uh, wonderful, wonderful present, and you get to see what, uh, what the future offers, and it's very positive. Since my days here as a student, UCC has become more progressive in terms of social values, diversity, learning, and outreach, while also respecting the traditions that make it a remarkable institution. I'll admit this is also a very intimidating forum for me, uh, maybe the most intimidating I've faced in, certainly in some years. I was never much of a speaker at UCC. I was one of those kids who preferred to put thoughts to paper rather than voice them, and uh, perhaps for good reason. My first speaking engagement uh, in the school was in grade nine English. Uh, when our teacher, who was a recent emigre from Britain and a diehard BBC listener, in introduced us to a game of rhetoric called Just a Minute. Uh, under the rules of the game, which was a radio sensation in England, uh, and England is fond of things like fried bread, so uh, keep that in mind, a student would be given a random topic, such as the NHL, and without time for preparation, speak on that subject for 60 seconds. Sounds simple enough. The catch, your classmates, i.e. your fiercest rivals, could shout you down for any number of infractions. Those included making lists, hesitating, repetition, and my greatest fault, and perhaps an early sign that I'd find myself in jur journalism, uttering gibberish. <laughs> By the rules of the game, if you successfully called out a speaker, you had to take the floor, and the boy who stood talking when the 60-second buzzer sounded, although I, th I think it was a little bell, uh, that student was declared the winner. I can't remember what the prize was, which suggests I never won. But to this day, I can't hear the word gibberish without also hearing in my mind the voices of 24 boys shouting down some poor soul. I hesitate to give speeches for another reason, and uh, that is I'm loath to presume the audience is at all interested in what I'm saying, uh, especially as the speech goes on. I mentioned this to, uh, to Jody Jacobson, who's done a wonderful job of helping organize tonight along with uh, Maria Karakolas. Thank you, Maria and Jody, for, uh, for tonight. This is fantastic. <clears throat> so I said to Judy, can't we do something that's a bit less of a monologue? And Jody came back with a terrific idea. Actually, I think she borrowed it from the students. And they said, let the audience participate. So tonight, we're going to make the Founders, Day, uh, Founders Dinner interactive. We're going to nudge this event into the age of social media. So if you have a mobile device, let's hear from you. Fire away with questions. There's a card on your table that uh, gives you the text number and the email address. But bear in mind, there's a moderator. So please, no texting me about making lists, Mr. McDougall. 
Uh, Mr. Higgins, if you're so inclined, gibberish is spelled with a G. I want to touch on three topics tonight. First, an editorial campaign we launched in the Globe called Time to Lead, and how it's using social media to change journalism and challenge the country. Second, the 1% movement, and why it's missing the mark. And third, a much more extraordinary social revolution that's underway, fueled by a new wave of philanthropy, a rise in volunteerism, and an explosion of technologies that are connecting humans like never before. And I'll finish with a story about bathing with 10 million people in India. Actually, why don't I start with that story? Uh, <laughs> India, 1992, New Delhi. Uh, my wife and I had just moved there, and uh, our most important possession we carried on an airplane. It was in a large box that filled an overhead bin entirely. It was a telex mach machine. Now, I had no idea how to work a telex machine, but I told I wouldn't survive in India uh, with, without one. It was how reporters uh, filed their stories in 1992, just as they had in 1892. And, <laughs> In those days when you landed at Indira Gandhi International Airport, if you had anything of value, a gold watch, a ring, or a telex machine, you were whisked away to a uh, small dusty corridor to uh, be inspected by the Indian Customs and Revenue Service. And sure enough, I was led to the, uh, customs, from the customs line to such a room where uh, the telex box was opened. I uh, paid a handsome amount for an electronics permit and then watched in astonishment as an elderly woman, barefoot, sat on the floor and tied the box together and then dripping wax from a candle sealed the, sealed the uh, knotted string. A customs officer presiding over that then stamped his region's insignia in the, in the wax, declaring our telex machine approved to enter India. Now, something remarkable about that machine. We never got to open it. It's, to use a telex machine in India or to get a telex line, you also had to have a telephone line. And as I was about to discover, to get a telephone line in 1992, you had to join a waiting list that was five years long. So being a naive Canadian fresh off the plane, I went to the telephone company, which was owned wholly by the government, and found a room about the size of this gymnasium, which I think it was a bit bigger, crowded with desks, each buried under stacks of file folders. And you had to move from desk to desk to get a form signed and stamped. So I finally got to a desk where there was a low-level official who mentioned, quite nonchalantly, that I could get a telephone line that week if I visited the local station and asked for one Mr. Kumar. Now, sure enough, two days later and $20 later, a couple of Mr. Kumar's men arrived at our flat on a single bicycle, one pedaling, the other sitting on the handlebars, with a spool of copper wiring, and within an hour we had our phone line. We had a local phone line. A long-distance phone line was a completely different matter, required a different permit. And then it all changed. The government opened the doors to competition, and before we knew it, we had long distance in our flat. And then again, we had, uh, before we knew it, we all had mobile phones. The fa uh, family who owned the house that we lived in, 14 members of them who lived upstairs, were able to get a second line for their teenagers and an internet connection. And soon those teenagers were moving to California for jobs in Silicon Valley. In less than a decade, the place was turned upside down. February 2001, another city called Allahabad, so this was the last time I was in India, around this time of year when northern India seems to uh, be enveloped perpetually in mist. And I was able to attend something called the Mahakum Mela, a religious festival that occurs every 12 years when the moon and three planets are aligned in such an auspicious formation that millions of people flock to the city, which sits at the confluence of the Ganges and Yamuna rivers, to bathe and cleanse the soul. So that winter, there I was among 10 million people on the riverbanks, where an entire makeshift town, really a little city, had been erected to accommodate, feed, and entertain the throngs. There were chai shops, and makeshift guest houses, and shops selling souvenirs, and these mystical markets in which devotees could shop for gurus, including one I'll never forget, a man who had kept his arm raised for about 25 years to the point of atrophy. It couldn't move, it was a dead limb. Also that he could transcend the limits of his body. As I'm walking through this swirl of humanity, I saw a sign above one of the huts that said, Internet Cafe, on the, mud, on the mud flats of the Ganges. Sure enough, inside the hut, which had a tented roof, uh, there were wooden boards, desks, and a bank of computers powered by a diesel generator and a string of cables that snaked up a bamboo pole up and over the river bank and across the field to the main phone line. For the equivalent of $2, I was able to connect with Toronto in a matter of seconds. Now, hang on to that thought because it's about the power of the human spirit 
and the ability of individuals to do a whole lot for society when given the right incentives. Flash forward to our Time to Lead, ca time to lead campaign. You may have seen some of the ads that we ran on TV or in movie theaters, showed a teenage girl on a bicycle, challenging us all to lead. Think about everything you've been given, she implored, and then turn when you're ready to begin. We saw her words as much more than a marketing message. It was a challenge to our readers to step up, to sign up, and to speak up. In challenging times, there are great opportunities to lead through change. And even in the, in the media, as troubled as our industry is, we wanted to show confidence, to express hope, to be bold. So far, the results have been pretty good. We're among the only quality newspapers in North America to see a, our paid circulation grow last year. We're speaking to more than 4 million Canadians a month through our web and mobile sites, including more women and more young Canadians than the Globe and Mail has ever reached. And through social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, our commentary streams, we have active conversations with close to half a million Canadians a month, including 2,000 readers given special status on our website to help us run Time to Lead. The idea for Time to Lead was born out of two conversations. The first was at the Vancouver Olympics, where several of us got to spend the evenings wandering through jam-packed streets, watching Canadians wave flags, play street hockey in the middle of downtown, and spontaneously burst into the singing of O Canada. We hadn't seen anything like this before, this expression of national confidence. Now remember, in 2010, Canadians were on top of the world, and it was about more than gold medals. We had fought heroically in Afghanistan. We led the world in many aspects of science and technology, from stem cell research to HIV, AIDS, vaccines, to computer animation. Our writers, poets, and musicians seem to be ever everywhere. We even made it to the cover of The Economist magazine, which for a Canadian is quite something. As one of our country's greatest fans, Bono, likes to say, the world needs more Canada. That was the other conversation with Bono. Now, don't take this the wrong way. I don't get to hang out with rock stars. I'm not sure I would want to. But when Bono was in Toronto for a concert, he invited a small group, group of us through a common friend to, host, to his hotel to talk about Canada. He was genuinely concerned that as much as he sees Canada around the planet, or Canadians, I'm sorry, as much as he sees Canadians around the planet doing great things, writing books, running banks, producing his records, fighting poverty, he was afraid that Canada as a nation was no longer doing great things. Could we be losing, he asked, our collective ambition? And that's what we wanted to put to our readers. Get off your butts, go build a better Canada, and tell us about it so we can tell others. That's why we created Time to Lead. Now, the 1%. What does this have to do with the 1%? Well, kind of nothing. Uh, well, nothing and everything. Let's start with a bit of context about the 1% label. And my eyes are going, so I'm seeing questions pop up, but can't quite read them. Huh. Would you allow your son to live on the streets as you did for research purposes? Uh, <laughs> I hope he didn't send that question. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I'm a great believer in uh, experiential journalism, in trying to get into other people's shoes, uh, to walk a bit in their footsteps. In India, I lived with uh, farmers. Uh, my wife, who's a photographer, and I uh, spent many days living on rail trains with uh, runaway kids to uh, understand uh, their existence. Uh, and I tried to do that both in Canada, not only in the, on the streets of Toronto, but on uh, native reserves as well. So uh, absolutely, I would encourage anyone, certainly for legitimate reasons, to try to share other people's experiences, certainly if you're going to, uh, if you're going to write about it. Uh, another good question, how successful have you been in, in monetizing the Globe's online and social media initiatives to reap revenues and profits? I think one of our bankers is here tonight, so I've got to be very careful in how I uh, answer it. Uh, it's, it's a massive success. Uh, next question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that whole monetizing the internet is, uh, is a great work in progress, uh, but, uh, but we're doing uh, reasonably well at it. We're running a, a, a decent profit, and I said we're, we're, we're growing, which compared to most newspaper companies in North America is, uh, is extraordinary. Uh, what in your opinion, or what is your opinion of paywalls and their value? or lack thereof. We're actually, we're uh, exploring rapidly uh, a paywall for 
what, what we call our premium content, especially our business journalism, which we think has a uh, special place in the Canadian market, and we want to test uh, whether, whether people are willing to, to pay for that. We've seen other media companies, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and now the New York Times, pursuing this model. We don't want to put a paywall around everything. Free is, uh, is not only the reality of our business, it's extraordinary. That's why we have four million online readers a month, but we think we can have both free and, uh, and premium. Jesus, will the least make the playoffs? <laughs> yeah, they'll, uh, they'll get eighth spot and be out in five. Uh, <clears throat> the, back to the one percenters. The, the idea of the one percenters grew out of a documentary made in 2006 by an heir to the Johnson & Johnson fortune. Who asked about the Leafs? Uh, it didn't really gain, gain traction, though, until the financial meltdown and subsequent re recession that were blamed in large part on an exceedingly well-paid financial community and its excessive use of leverage. If you look beyond the financial crisis, though, the 1% is an extraordinary and very often positive force. It's pretty much everyone in this room, let's admit it. If you make more than $196,000 $196, a year, uh, you're a one percenter. Uh, but to me, Canada seems too small a pool. So how about globally? Well, if you make $55,000 a year, you're in the global 1%. But why limit ourselves to the 1%? It's an arbitrary cutoff. Why not say 10%? That's also an elite. Well. Every, every adult in this room is probably in that group as well. If you make $65,000 a year, you're in the top 10% of income earners in this uh, country. Any way you slice it, we are all part of a super elite. And that's missing the point. Our concern should not be about the, uh, the level of the elite, but uh, excessive income inequality, which has shifted quite sharply in the last two, two decades. Now, inequality is not automatically a bad thing. Uh, most of us have seen around the world that it fuels competition, ambition, and innovation. In the golden decades of the 1950s and 60s, there was inequality, within reason. There was enough to inspire innovation and reward investment, but not so much as to limit social mobility. That's changed since the 1980s, and the ratio of uh, top income earners, the top 20% to the bottom 20%, has pretty much doubled in the last 30 years. And as, the, as those with great education, access to technology, and the social confidence to go beyond our borders, i.e. many here tonight, have done exceedingly well. In such an environment, it's entirely predictable that there will be growing political pressure to change things, especially through more progressive taxation. Beware, I say. Redistribution of wealth has always been a chimera of social justice. I saw this in spades in India. When we moved there, the country was just discarding 40 years of socialist economic policy, including very high tax rates for the wealthy and for business. You couldn't do anything in the country commercially without paying a king's ransom. Yet everywhere we went in India, we discovered there was a very comfortable 1%. They kept their money, well, in other countries. Some of them literally buried gold in their gardens, or they just paid officials to look the other way and a giant black market existed for everything. Now, Canada is not India. We're an affluent country. We're an affluent country with more going for us than most of us appreciate, and yet not enough opportunity, social or economic, for a growing number. I don't think we're going to see crowds of people storming the gates of UCC anytime soon, but that's not really the, uh, the point or the, the, the concern. The danger is not to us, but to our future, in knowing that by limiting the opportunities for so many, we're going to be limiting the opportunity for, opportunities for Canada. I'd suggest we have a choice. Sit back and allow governments to shape our future. Fight like mad to keep governments off our back. Or step up, or step it up, and seed social change with three basic tools. Time, treasure, and technology. Fortunately, there's huge change out there on each front. Let's start with money. We're in the age of philanthropy. It's exploded over the last decade not because of some sudden enlightenment, we're in the midst of a historic wealth transfer, driven largely by two large groups, the generation of post-war entrepreneurs and investors like Warren Buffett and Peter Monk, who want to do more than leave their fortunes to, to, uh, to their children. In fact, both have said they're not leaving anything for their children. And secondly, the, what I call the techno elite, the Bill Gates and Larry Ellisons of the world, who I think see wealth a bit like technology, as something that's, that's transient. Either way, it's the, or with both groups, it's the biggest voluntary transfer of wealth the world has seen. Last year, America's 50 biggest philanthropists gave away $10 billion, more than all 34 million of us Canadians gave. But despite our traditional stinginess, Canadians are getting there. And it's not the Peter Monks who are in the driver's seat. 
Consider the new wave of family foundations. There's 10,000 of them now across the country, including many represented in this room. The vast majority of these foundations are not the rich and famous that you may read about. They're families who have assets of under $5 million but want to do something exceptional for their communities and are following the foundation path to do that. As, bo as boomers retire and begin planning their own estates and legacies, this wave will only grow. Second, time, volunteering. It's not just about money. In fact, money is becoming a less important part of social engagement. Canadians want to be involved in social change. They want their time, their ideas, their energy to be seen as valuable. This too will only grow as the boomers retire and as a globe-trotting, social-media-minded social media millennials offer up their skills and their global insights to volunteer efforts. Another shout out for Table 50 on that front. Already, Canadians are among the most active volunteers in the world. 46% of us volunteered in the past year. The highest rate is among younger Canadians, but the rest of us are catching up. Those of us in the middle age bracket, 46 to 57, I'm glad middle age has moved from 35 to 45 to 46 to 57, are volunteering at a clip much higher than was recorded in the 70s and 80s. That age group back then volunteered at a rate of 25% or 25% of people in that age group volunteered in the, in, over the course of the year, now it's 31%. Those who contribute the most hours, interestingly, are seniors, especially those with higher levels of income and education. The biggest increase in the number of volunteers over the past decade was among, was among those 65 and over. A typical new Canadian senior, age 65 to 74, now volunteers 250 hours a year. Again, as boomers retire with more education, more income, and more varied work experience than ever before, this should continue. Lastly, technology. Humans have never been more connected to more humans than we are today. We're able to talk to each other, share information, and influence strangers in ways once controlled only by media moguls. We now need to channel that power to positive change, and it's something Canadians are good at. A few years ago, long before he was diagnosed with cancer, I visited Jack Layton in his Parliament Hill office. We, often, we met from time to time, argued a lot, we agreed on very little, but I always respected his insights into uh, Canada and Canadians. And Jack, in, as he would uh, often lecture me with that twinkle in his eye and smile on his fa face, decided to lecture me that day on the surge of youth engagement and elder activism. He was especially animated on the early boomers and what he called the million grannies, women born in the 40s and early 50s, who aren't happy with the state of planet Earth. He believed that that, uh, that that generation would hook up by technology with their grandchildren and bring about uh, enormous change in the country. He was on to something. Today, social media growth is highest among those aged 55 to 64. The number of people on social media in that co cohort is about the same as for 18 to 25s. Ask Facebook. Its fastest growing audience is women over the age of 45. In fact, according to Comscore, a media measurement company, about half of all people on social media are now over the age of 50, 30, 35. It's why we have 100,000 followers of the Globe and Mail now on Twitter, something we think we can double this year. Don't for a second believe social media is only for the young and only for the frivolous. Along with philanthropy and volunteerism, it's the greatest agent of social change we've seen in our gener generation. Now, one of the last times I saw Jack was in our offices in Toronto last April, in the final weeks of uh, the election campaign. Uh, he was there to meet our editorial board and to show off his new iPad 2 which Olivia had given him for Christmas. And he marveled at its power to connect, and not just for fun. He thought it would be the device that brought together those million grannies and uh, the, the generation of their grandchildren and bring about a, a revolution, for him, a political revolution. His error, in my view, was believing that positive change is best delivered by the state, when history is telling us right now the very opposite. Look around the world look around the country. We're so lucky to live in is the power that we've been given as individuals and the opportunity to use that power collectively. The most progressive forces on the planet are very non-governmental, very, non very open, and very young. The greatest force in education over the past decade, I'd suggest it's Wikipedia. In media, hands down, Facebook. Advertising, Google. In diplomacy, it's not Hillary Clinton, it's Twitter, at least if you were in Tahrir Square last winter. In international development, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and their anti-malaria program. Each of these was created by individuals wanting to lead, 
not through the power of the state, but through the power of an idea and the passion of many. Someone simply decided it was their time to lead. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and old boys, thank you for sharing tonight. Thank you, Jim Power and faculty, for running such an inspirational school. I'd like to say uh, special thanks to a very special guest, my father, Reg, who uh, has joined me here tonight at the age of 86. <clears throat> And uh, in, in my days at UCC, when I was not always bringing uh, great honor to uh, the school, was always behind me, as a great father always is. And Kaleem, thank you for leading the way. I hope you'll invite me back in a decade or two, or two decades' time to hear you speak about all that has yet to be created and all that it will, be inspi that it will inspire. Good evening.